Um, so we're looking at, at Psalm 1 this evening. And uh, if we were to take a straw poll this evening of favourite Bible books, I'm fairly certain that the book of Psalms would be near the top. Um, it's a familiar part of scripture to us. Uh, it's familiar even to non-Christians. And uh, this evening we're looking at Psalm 1, which, as you would expect, functions as something of an introduction to the whole of the book of Psalms. Um, the, the subject of Psalm 1 is fairly obvious right from the first word. It's about blessing. Psalm 1 takes up the subject of where blessing is to be found. And this is the theme for the whole of the book of Psalms. The psalmist, the, author, the authors of the Psalms are all concerned with the same message. And that message is that blessing is found here and nowhere else. And it's worth just pausing at the beginning, even just at this point, just in case we miss how incredibly relevant this is. Um, every human being who has ever lived, and that includes all of us logged in online this evening, every human being has made it their life goal to be blessed. And it's a strange word, isn't it, in, in society today, blessed. We don't hear it used in many contexts. Uh, but here it essentially means to be made happy, uh, to be made joyful. Uh, there's a completeness to this word blessed here. Uh, it means that the person, the blessed fullness of happiness and, and a variety of happiness that is not merely a fleeting happiness that changes as the weather changes. Uh, there's not a single soul on the face of this planet who does not have it as their life aim to know this fullness of joy. Uh, we, we might and we do go about our quest in very different ways, but no matter what the pursuit looks like, the object of the pursuit is without exception, true and lasting joy. And so Psalm 1 is unwaveringly relevant. And we mustn't believe the myth that the Bible is outdated and irrelevant. And we mustn't believe the myth that God is somehow a killjoy uh, because the Psalms exist to point us in the direction of true joy and to warn us that there is nowhere else where this joy can be found. And so with that in mind, look down at the first two verses that we read in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. A blessed is the man who rejects the counsel of the wicked, the way of sinners, and the seat of scoffers. And there's a completeness about these sentences as well. Uh, we'll come on to that in a moment, but it's worth remembering, first of all, that the Psalms are poems. Uh, what we're reading is the translation of Hebrew poetry. And you don't have to be a scholar in poetry to know that poets tend not to write literally. Uh, a poet uses metaphors and imagery. And that's what's happening here. Uh, the Psalmist is not saying that there is a literal wicked counsel that you need to avoid if you are to be blessed. And he's not saying that there is a literal way or place where sinners walk. And if you want to be blessed, then you need to avoid it. Uh, nor is there a literal place where scoffers sit. And if you want to be blessed, you better not sit there. It's imagery. And it's imagery that signals a complete rejection of this way of life. Blessed is the man who does not walk, stand, or sit in the counsel of the wicked. The way of sin is the seat of scoffers. Blessed is the man who totally rejects this lifestyle and instead, verse 2, delights in the law of the Lord. Now, have you ever pondered what it means to delight in the law of the Lord? Now, perhaps you're here. And uh, you've read and, and you've heard this psalm countless times. Uh, likewise, Psalm 19, 
where David says that the law of the Lord is to be desired more than gold and is sweeter than honey. Oh, Psalm 119, which takes similar themes and holds up the person who delights in the law of the Lord as being blessed. Have you ever wondered what it means to delight in the law of the Lord? Well, to answer that question, what does it mean to delight in the law of the Lord? Uh, we need to answer it in two parts. First of all, what did it mean for the Israelites to delight in the law of the Lord? And secondly, what does it mean for us to delight in the law of the Lord? So first of all, what did it mean for the Israelites to delight in the law of the Lord? Well, the law to the Israelites was the sign that they belonged to Yahweh, to the God of Israel. In Exodus, uh, when God uh, gives the Israelites the Ten Commandments, when he gives them the moral law, God speaks before he gives the Ten Commandments and he says, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a, a, a carved image, etc., etc. But God said there, in effect, I am the Lord, your God, and as my people, here is how you are to live. Uh, it's important that we recognize it, that the law comes in in that manner and, and after that preface to the law. We come to Psalm 1, uh, we're to read, uh, I am the Lord your God, uh, and as my people here, this is how you ought to live. Um, we're, we're to understand it, to, to be saying you ought to live in this way. Because this way of living is a reflection of the God uh, who has given the law. Um, to delight in the law of the Lord is to delight in the Lord who has given the law. Is essentially the point. Um, you, you might see this around, uh, perhaps you see it down in Swansea. Um, well, I don't see it so much since I, I've moved over here, but you see um, people wearing proudly during the Euros their Welsh football shirts. I, I saw one in Chester the other week and, and it was great to see. Um, but you see you see the, the young boys, perhaps uh, young children wearing their football shirts and they're proud to be wearing their football shirts, Wales or whoever their team is. Uh, why is it? What is it that they're proud about? Well, they're not they're not walking around with their football shirt on thinking, well, look at this fabric. Look how breathable this fabric is. Look at these um, look at these great stitching, this great stitching on my shirt. Look how great this shirt is. They're not thinking that they're thinking, look how great my team is. Uh, they're delighting in the one who the, the, the team who the shirt represents. And for the Israelite, to delight in the law of the Lord was to delight in the Lord himself. The law represented the Lord. He is the one who gave it. Uh, it is so closely connected with him that for the, for the blessed person to delight in the law of the Lord was to delight in the Lord himself. It was to say... I love being in covenant with you, O oh Lord. And so I delight in keeping your covenant laws. That's what it meant. And so what does it mean then for you and I to delight in the law of the Lord today? Well, this really is the burning question, isn't it? Because this is where blessing is to be found. This is where fullness of joy is to be had and so how are we then to delight in the law of the Lord? And the answer is found in the fact that there is one who appeared, had not yet appeared when this psalm was written, who fully and totally embodied the law, the image of God, Jesus Christ. He has appeared. The nature and character of God is somewhat revealed in the law. 
And so to delight in the law is to delight in God's character because the law is a revelation of God's character. But in Jesus, we see the perfect, complete revelation of who God is. He is God in the flesh. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, Hebrews 1, 3. He himself is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1, 15. And so in the new covenant, God has revealed himself not, not only in words at Mount Sinai, like he did at Mount Sinai, but he has revealed himself in flesh. And there are no contradiction here. God is no different in the New Testament to in the Old Testament. Everything that is revealed of God's nature in the law is embodied in Jesus Christ. And so what we see in him, we see in the law. And what we see in the law, we, we see in him. The fullness of God's glory has been revealed now in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that in mind, what does it mean for us to delight in the law of the Lord? Well, to light, for us to delight in the law of the Lord is to delight in Christ, the very embodiment of the law. Uh, you know, the law had nothing in itself that was worth delighting in, in and of itself. For the Israelite, it was not the mere commands that David waxed lyrical about in Psalm 119. No, it was the fact that they showed him the nature of his God, who he was in covenant with. But Jesus, as the image of God, as the incarnation of God, he is worth delighting in, in himself, because he is God in the flesh. And there is nothing in Jesus Christ that is not worthy of our delight. He is altogether lovely. In him is fullness of joy. He is where all blessing is to be found and it can be found nowhere else. Well, the question then that faces us this evening from Psalm 1 is what do you make of Jesus? Um, what do you make of him? Do you delight in him? Uh, have you ever delighted in him? Do you now, today, find your delight in him? Because your eternal destiny hangs on that question. When your life is over, when you stand before the Father, the question before you will be, what do you think of my son? And the Psalms want to ask us this same question this evening they ask of us have you ever seen that the beauty of christ the beauty of the blessed man and have you seeing his beauty fallen on your knees in repentance what do you make of him today that psalm one is a warning to you don't get caught up in the counsel of the wicked the way of sinners the seat of scoffers remember that blessing is only found in delighting in Christ. Don't lose sight of that. You know, if we're here this evening as, as Christians, as people who are, who are gathering to pray, let's not lose sight of our calling to delight in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, perhaps you are here and uh, you're you're asking the question, how? Uh, how do we find our delight in the Lord Jesus Christ? How do we delight in him more and more? Well, Psalm 2 points us in a direction by saying uh, that the blessed person meditates on his law day and night, on God's law day and night. And day and night, again, in this, in this psalm, uh, it, it functions as a, as a piece of Hebrew poetry to paint this picture of completeness. Uh, there, there's not a minute that goes by without the blessed man meditating on the law of the Lord. And so how are we to delight in Christ 
we need to fill our lives with him. Fill our mind with thoughts about him. Fill our reading with books about him that are full of Christ. And we need to work hard to talk more about Christ and to talk more freely about Christ. And so we're to gear everything in our lives towards delighting in him. So this is where blessing is found and blessing is found nowhere else. And the rest of the psalm consists of two illustrations, an illustration of the blessed man being like a tree and the illustration of the wicked being like chaff. And the illustration of the one who delights in the law of the Lord, who delights in Christ, who ultimately embodies Psalm 1 uh, as, as being like a tree. And the illustration of the one who, who does not delight in Christ as being like chaff. And I want us to just walk through these, uh, the, these verses really briefly and see the, the characteristics of the blessed man and, and then in turn the characteristics of the wicked as the psalm holds them out to us. So first of all, the blessed man, what is he like? Well, first of all, notice where he is planted. Uh, he's planted in Psalm 1 verse 3 by streams of water. And, uh, and this provokes two kinds of imagery for us. There's, there's an agricultural imagery to it, uh, but there's also a, a, a biblical imagery to it. Uh, so Im imagine that we were to have a conversation with a tree and uh, we would say to him, uh, tree, what do you want to do with your life? And uh, this particular tree uh, is a fruit tree. And so, of course, he would answer, well, I want to bear fruit. Uh, that's my purpose in life. And I want to do the best job that I can do. And you say to the tree, OK, fine. Uh, where would you like to go in order to do this? You can go anywhere. I'll plant you anywhere. Where would you like to go? And, uh, and the tree would say, I want to be by streams of water. Um, particularly if you were to think of this tree that we were having this imaginary conversation with as an Israelite tree, um, they would want to be near streams of water, perhaps if we were speaking with a, an, a tree in the UK at the height of winter, they might say, just get me away from all this rain. I want some sunshine. But this is an Israelite tree. And so, of course, they want to be by streams of water. Uh, by streams of water, the, the tree has everything he needs. Uh, blessed is the man who delights in Christ, the psalmist says, because he has everything he needs. And so do you realize this evening that if you're in Christ, you have everything that you need? Um, there's an agricultural sense to it, you see. But there's also a, a biblical sense to the imagery. And the description of this tree in Psalm 1 would, without a doubt, have referred the Israelite back to Eden. The first few chapters of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, we read there a description of another tree, the tree that grew in Eden. And so in Genesis 2, verse 8, it says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden uh, were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden and from there it was separated into four headwaters and so there's a river splitting into four streams supplying all the minerals and nutrients for the garden of Eden and it's a picture full of life full of beauty and the psalmist is saying, such is the person whose delight is in Christ, planted in the place where the supply never runs dry. And not only would this conjure up uh, imagery of Eden for the Israelite, but it should also conjure up imagery for us of Revelation chapter 22, 
where the Apostle John describes the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth. So in Revelation 22, we read that the angel, John writes, showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. What's the picture there in, in, in the vision of Revelation 22? It's a picture of life and fruit in abundance. And this is how the life of the Christian is to look full of vitality and fruitfulness. Why? Not because you roll your sleeves up and you work really hard. Not because you've earned it. Not because that's just the kind of person you are. But because in Christ, you are planted in the place where life and fruitfulness are found. He is the source of life. He is the vine, as John puts it. So first of all, notice where he is planted. But secondly, notice where the blessed man, the blessed person, um, notice what the blessed person yields. Um, Psalm 1 verse 3, again, in the next line, it says that he, he yields its fruit in its season like a tree that yields its fruit in its season. And again, this conjures up the imagery of Eden and the new Jerusalem, where we see an abundance of fruit. And what we see here in Psalm 1 is the consistency of the blessed man's fruit bearing. He's like a tree that yields its fruit in its season, the psalmist says. Not a season passes where the tree fails to bear fruit. Whether or not trees bear fruit is dependent upon many factors, isn't it? Um, those of you who grow plants, those of you who have fruit trees will, will know all about that. Uh, but not here in Psalm 1, not the tree of Psalm 1. Every season, every season fruit is born. The Bible talks about fruit as being the results and the, and the consequences of being joined to Christ. Like literal fruit is the result of life in the tree. And this is why James says it's impossible to have faith without works, because true, genuine faith produces good works in the Christian. That's what the blessed man is like. And fruit, it really has two purposes. First of all, uh, it has a functional purpose, a utility. It's, it's good for food. And secondly, uh, it has a, a purpose of beauty. It adds color. It's a sign of life. And this is what the characteristics of the blessed man are for. Beauty and utility. And the purposes of fruit always involve the good of others, don't they? So that others might see and enjoy the beauty, so that others might eat and enjoy its goodness. And it's the same with, with fruit in the Christian's life. Delighting in Christ results in spiritual fruit, and this spiritual fruit is always for the benefit of others. And so think of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Oh, well, what is the point of being full of love if you can never express that love towards others? What is the point of being joyful if it never influences others? What are the purposes of peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and so on if they're never put to use? to bless others. And so the man who delights in Christ, the person who delights in Christ is blessed and blesses others with a consistent bearing of spiritual fruit. Thirdly, finally, for the blessed person, 
notice so where he's planted what he yields thirdly notice how he endures uh, psalm again in, in verse three says he's like a tree his leaf does not wither his leaf does not wither and whatever he does in all that he does he prospers the fruitfulness of the person who delights in Christ endures forever. You know, one of our most deeply ingrained fears is that our lives will count for nothing. Uh, we want to leave an impact on the world. Well, the psalm shows us that the life spent delighting in Christ will stand the test of eternity. This is what counts. And so everything else, our, our well-presented houses won't last forever. Our carefully sculpted careers won't last forever. Our organizations, our empires, they won't stand the test of eternity. But what does endure forever is the life of the blessed person, the fruit that he bears as he delights in Christ, that endures forever. This is what our souls pine for when they pine for this purpose. Uh, the elements can't cause this tree's leaf to wither. Old age can't cause his leaf to wither. Whatever life throws at the person who delights in Christ will not cause them to drown because, because the banner of their life is take the world, but give me Jesus. And nobody can take him away from them. Those who delight in Christ endure. Their roots are planted deep this, again, is why we now need to take every measure to delight in Christ, because life is going to be tough and there are going to be storms. And we need to make sure that our roots are planted deep into him by delighting in him more and more each day. Well, the rest of the psalm is summed up. By this one line at the start of verse four. And it says, the wicked are not so. Um, as the reader, we've been taken to see the, the luscious green and fruitful life of the blessed person, the person who delights in Christ. And then we're brought crashing down with these words, not so the wicked. Briefly and sharply, there are three things this psalm shows us about those who do not know Christ. Number one, they are not planted. Chaff is what remains when a, a farmer has gathered in the wheat from its field. It's the waste product of wheat, kind of like tumbleweed. It's not planted. It's, uh, never mind it being planted by streams of water. It, it's not planted at all. The wind just blows it away. It's unstable. And so it is, the psalmist says, for the lives of those who don't know Christ. Uh, secondly, the psalmist shows us that uh, the lives of those who, who don't know Christ, um, they yield nothing. Chaff, the description given in verse four, the wicked are not so, but like chaff that the wind drives away, does not yield any fruit. While the tree is planted by streams of water and it, and it yields an abundance of fruit, chaff yields nothing, no lasting beauty or utility, no usefulness, just driven along by the wind. And so it is, Psalm 1 says, for those who do not know and delight in Christ. Thirdly, finally, while the blessed man will stand in the judgment and in the assembly of the righteous, the wicked will not, the wicked will not endure. 
They're not planted, they yield nothing. They do not endure, but rather they will perish, the psalm says. All of their purposes will fall down if they do not know Christ. Nothing outside of him will stand in the judgment. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, verse 6 says, but the way of the wicked will perish. And the psalm ends on that somber note. And so Psalm 1 exists to show us the beauty of Christ and the attractiveness of the one who delights in him. It exists to show us where blessing can be found and to show us that blessing can be found nowhere else. And so in Christ, then, we know this evening that we are blessed beyond our wildest imagination. And yet, as the psalm ends on a somber note, perhaps we also will end on a somber note. Because outside of him, outside of Christ, we have nothing. <laughs>